All right. Uh, welcome to DJI Enterprises webinar on creating maps and models for emergency response. I'm Eric, the Senior Marketing Manager for the Europe region, and your main presenter today uh, is Grant Ostica, who is our Solutions Engineer in North America. Grant leads public safety and works closely with R&D. His main responsibility is to make sure that insights we gather from customers are incorporated in the development of our products. So he's quite close to that market, and I'm sure he'll be able to bring you a lot of uh, uh, learnings for today. Now, before we start uh, the next slide, just a couple of housewarming or admin stuff. Um, below, you you can find the chat feature, and you can speak by, uh, uh, through that channel and not through the audio. So we encourage you to write down your questions or comments via chat. Um, later on, at the end of the presentation, once we finish, uh, you can, uh, we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, webinar will also be sent to you after, and also the presentation deck. Next slide. So today's topic is creating maps and models for emergency response. We've seen a lot of public safety professionals uh, using our drones, not only for aerial surveillance or for thermal, gathering thermal data, but also using it to create maps and models. Uh, this is very relevant to today. And what you'll see is we're going to take you through why mapping and modeling is beneficial, at least some top level of uh, findings. And Grant, and I'll turn it over to Grant to take you through the workflow um, and some tips to try to get the best results out of our drones and our solution, our software, DJI Terra. We'll end this presentation by answering some of your questions, of course. Uh, yeah, without further ado, let's start. So how mapping and, and modeling help when it comes to public safety? So drones have taken great leaps in public safety, and you know that you're close to this tool and because it it it, it, it helps save lives um in our live rescue map we've counted about 730 plus um rescues and it's only the beginning over to the next slide uh we've seen more and more public safety personnel are relying on gis data to get the better of uh, uh, to enhance their location and challenges and some Sample use cases would be, of course, mapping for post-disaster response, accident reconstruction, and event management. Next slide. Uh, in the Europe region, uh, a few months ago, last December, uh, the Norway was struck with the large, the biggest landslide in Norway, and it became the biggest drone operation with about 200 hours of airtime. Uh, a lot of a lot of lives were lost but drones were very critical in this rescue operation especially using them for mapping for emergency response on to the next slide next slide uh, here you will see that having a map gets a detailed impression of the situation and possible hazards in this case the Norwegian rescue workers needed to study the broken structural integrity of the soil, which might lead to subsequent landslides in order to assess any risk that, in that regard. So here you will see that they created multiple maps with the Matrice 300 RTK and the H20P. And yeah, they, cre they created a series of maps for this periodic interval. Here you could see a map, a sample of the map. Sorry, Grant. Next slide. Next slide, Grant. Hello. I think you might be having a few technical difficulties on your end with the screen sharing, so I'll wrap it up here. But essentially, I think the end story there was better planning and allocation of resources for the team, identifying environmental risks before sending people in, 
and providing insight to them, and then quickly recovering post-disaster with an additional tool in the toolbox. So I wanted to share that one example there before we kind of go into the workflow of how maps and models are created to kind of perk the interest and then show you how you could do that yourself with your agency or potentially current fleet of drones. And a workflow overview here within the DJI ecosystem, I think you see a few items that a lot of folks I talk to on the public safety side aren't necessarily aware of. So we do have mission planning tools within our DJI apps. We have software to process that data into outputs. So how this workflow works at a high level, right? We're planning our mission, we're putting in mission parameters, determining the area that is gonna be mapped, collecting that data with the drone. DJI Terra is our photogrammetry software that can process this data. And then obviously in the end here, while we're going through all this, is to utilize that output there for generating a 2D map or 3D model. I like this picture here. It's actually a screenshot from DJI Terra, and you can see these green dots in the skies, actually locations of different drone photos. It goes back and forth in that lawnmower pass that you may be familiar with, uh, taking photos as the drone's going. And each of those photos has overlaps, so the software is able to find tie points between those photos in generating our map and model. So at a high level, that's how this process works. We get from having our drone to getting a 2D map or 3D model. And today, I'm going to try to strike a balance in the mission planning between folks who have not done this before or folks who are using mission planning right now and maybe add some tips that you could try to improve your results. Uh, that being said, a lot of this is very pertinent to the situation or use case. So would encourage you before utilizing any of these tips or ideas in real case scenarios, making sure to try them out in practice scenarios and running through it beforehand. So with mission planning, before we do go through the process to create a 2D map or 3D model, important to look at a few items, one being, do we need it in this scenario? Um, it's obviously what the topic of a webinar and would love you to create a great 2D map or 3D model, um, but if we're able to do it with just drone photos, um, that is what it is. But if we have a larger area, obviously definite value in being able to stitch that into one map, one image that can be looked at and planned with, the ability to take measurements of our 2D map or 3D model if we want to quickly estimate an area or distance, or just the ability to put someone into a scene. We've had situations where mapping a landslide and having rescuers look at a 3D model before going in provides some great situational awareness. So assuming we are creating a 2D map or 3D model, moving on here, now, one of the things to be considered is, do we care about the accuracy of our map? And for the majority of first responders in the majority of situations, the objective is more situational awareness or general information. But if we move into some of those type of scenes, such as accident reconstruction, crime scene reconstruction, and we're looking to make precise measurements and there's going to be decisions or calculations made off of those, accuracy does come into play. And we'll keep it a bit higher level today. We have some more in-depth uh, blogs on our enterprise insights if you're looking to get deeper into these topics. But essentially, two types of accuracy uh, you will talk about when referring to models. Relative accuracy, so is the length of the car's wheel in the model, how accurate is that compared to real life? And then absolute accuracy. Uh, the location, if we have a point on our model, how accurate is that compared to a coordinate system uh, that we're referencing? So two different types of accuracy there, but some things to consider there would be using a drone with RTK capability to make corrections to the locations of our photos in real time. 
or PPK to do that after the fact, which does require an RTK drone as well, or placing ground control points, which you can see an example image on the right, where we can take a base station out and mark a GPS location very accurately and use that in the processing of our model to make sure the model is referenced correctly to our coordinate system. Same idea here with checkpoints where we would go out and mark them with a base station, but with a checkpoint, uh, as it says, we're checking it after the fact, after we've generated the model, instead of using these points to uh, reference the model in the, the first place. So definitely could go a lot more in depth on those items, uh, but we'll just leave those there for you to explore in greater depth if that is applicable to your operations. So now moving on in our mission planning thing, which app or drones can be used? And quite a lot of them honestly can. Uh, DJI Pilot is our app for our enterprise drones and our two flagship models for surveying and mapping the Truce 300 RTK with the P1 or the Phantom 4 RTK if you're using the remote controller without a screen. Uh, those both can be used with a DJI Pilot for your mission planning. Other drones as well, such as the Enterprise Advance, can certainly be used as well, but realize that we're going to be using that for more situational awareness in our data collection rather than survey grade data. We have flying a Phantom 4 series using the Mavic 2 Pro and you have the remote controller without the screen, you can use DJI Ground Station Pro. And then if you're using the Phantom 4 RTK with the remote controller with the built-in screen, you'd probably end up using Ground Station RTK. So today we're going to focus on DJI Pilot as it hits on the most of you using the Enterprise drones. But the concepts we talk about are applicable across all three applications here. And no matter what mission planning application you're using um, and depending on what you know drone you're using you do have uh, different capabilities so when we first opening the dji pilot app i know some of you uh, often just go to manual flight by default for operations but on the other side of the house here we have mission flight which allows us to automate these missions so within mission flight, you could pre-plan the area you wanted to map or model by creating a KML on something like Google Earth. Go to earth.google.com and draw that out. You can export that, put on an SD card and bring it into the pilot app here, or we can manually create a route, which is what we'll show here today. So on that side, after we create a route, you'll be able to select your type. And for us here, we're gonna be doing a mapping mission. We'll then pull up our map. You can tap on the map to initially create your mapping area. And then running through your options on the top there, uh, the circle with the X in it would delete the point you currently have selected, which is shown in blue. And then the trash can would crash the entire mission and you'd be able to tap to create, again, example, you put it in the completely wrong location, you don't wanna worry about dragging all those points over. So can manipulate those points, can tap on one of the pluses to plan your mission area, use that circle with the X to delete a point and define that. On the top right side there, we have the I, which shows geozones, uh, the little circle GPS point to bring you to your current location. The locked north point will orient your map to the north. The layers button, you could switch between kind of the street view and the satellite view. And then the eraser button would actually erase your drone's flight route if you had been flying around that previous flight route is showed on the map. So after we've drawn our location that we want to be assessing here, you can click the arrows on the right side to pull out our mission planning information. And from there, we would select the camera being used. If you're using a Matrice 200 and you're not seeing the payloads on here that you need to use for your operations, you can click on custom camera and input those 
values. And if you're not sure what those are, quick Google search, DJI custom camera parameters will pop up a forum post on that with information on all of the different cameras that you may use on the mapping side. After you select a camera, one of the values you'll see is ground sampling distance here in the application, which we'll cover here in just a second. If you're flying the Matrice 300 RTK, you do have an option for terrain follow if you're using RTK. However, you do need to bring in the digital elevation model yourself, either from publicly available data like the SRTM data set, or you can generate it from a previous mission flight in that area. But getting into some of the key mission planning questions here that we always hear from folks is our flight route altitude, right? How high do we need to fly? And that is a, a tough question. You're like, come on, I'm looking for an answer. That's why I came to this webinar here. But actually, it really does depend on your situation. One of the, I'd say, scientific ways to determine that would be looking at GSD, ground sampling distance, which, as we know, photos are made up of pixels. And this is the difference between the center point of two consecutive pixels. And we determine a ground sampling distance based on the altitude of the drone and some of the camera specs that we're looking at, such as the sensor size within the camera itself. So how this could be applicable is if you're going out and running some practice missions and you're looking to identify something within your map, if you're able to determine the ground sampling distance with one drone in your fleet, and you do end up using you know, different drones across the fleet there, you could just shoot for a specific ground sampling distance there, or you know when you go out to do a mission, you know the specific ground sampling distance you're shooting for, and that's shown in the app with your altitude. Um, lower ground sampling distance can lead to some higher measurement accuracy, so if we're flying up at 400 feet max flight here in the US, you may not have the highest measurement accuracy there. But once again, depending on the situation, uh, that may not be as important. So with the higher altitude we fly, you're going to need to take less photos, which allows us to fly the mission quicker and process it in a quicker fashion. So there is a bit of a trade-off there. Uh, between the measurement accuracy and the speed of our flight, and with that measurement accuracy, the ground sampling distance there. Would caution against flying too low, uh, as if we're flying too low, it can cause some issues for our post-processing software or really, really any photogrammetry software uh, there. So once again, my suggestion here would be to actually start as you know high as you know, possible or reasonable in the area that you're operating, because that's going to make life easiest, fewest photos, quickest workflow. And then after the fact there, can lower it down and look at that GSD if that is a consideration. The other big question is overlap ratio. So we have side overlap ratio and front overlap ratio. So if you're looking at the image on the right here, you can see there's distance between these lines going back and forth like we're mowing our, our lawn. If we increased the side overlap, those lines are gonna get tighter together. If we decreased it, they're gonna be farther apart. And then the front overlap is how often the camera is triggering as it's going along the line here and the overlap of those photos. Obviously, we talked about before, overlap is required for successfully stitching our imagery together Otherwise, we're not going to be able to put things together. We're going to have holes in the area that's mapped. We have default values in the pilot app, 70% side and 80% front, which I think are pretty good to stick with for most situations. It is important to consider if you are mapping an area, for example, with a bunch of tree canopy, where it's going to be difficult for the software to find those tie points, differentiate, and stitch those photos together. Increasing the overlap some you know, like up to 85% maybe uh, could lead to better results, uh, but there's no need to push that up to something like 
percent. That's just going to be giving the post-processing software issues, and also going to take a very long time uh, to put together. Another item to consider is if we do have terrain in the area where the drone is going to need to go up or go down. There is, like we showed earlier in the pilot app, an avenue to do that with the Matrice 300 RTK. Um, but if we're doing a simple mission planning where the drone's staying at the same height during the mission, it's important to consider that if the terrain is going up, uh, that affects our overlap ratio. So if you don't plan for that, the overlap ratio may not be sufficient in that area where the ground is all of a sudden closer to the drone. So an easy rule of thumb there is to try to take off from a higher altitude when running the mission and then that can lead to better results across the survey as a whole because if there's anything that is uh, lower altitude than you planned you're going to have more than enough uh, overlap there. So just something uh, to consider during your operations there also to consider your above ground altitude to make sure you're staying legal and any obstacles during the mission. So moving back into the settings here, you can set that flight route altitude we just talked about. Uh, target surface to takeoff point, if you happen to be in an urban environment and you weren't taking off from the location itself, maybe you were in a rooftop in the area, you could make an adjustment there to say, hey, I'm taking off from this altitude, but my target surface, what I'm actually going to map, uh, the difference of the altitude there. And then takeoff speed is just going to be the speed at which we fly from our takeoff point to where we're starting the mission. As we move down there, speed is what's actually used during the mission itself. So a question I do get sometimes is why can't I make the speed faster? Uh, and that's directly related to the abilities of the camera itself. Uh, we do have limitations with our cameras as to how fast they're able to continuously take photos over this long period of time with the processing there. And then also your values with overlap, right? With frontal overlap, we have to take a photo uh, every uh, certain time distance or uh, distance itself, you have the option there. So if we're taking frequent photos, we're not able to necessarily increase the speed. So the app will let you increase the speed as much as possible based on the camera and parameters selected. But just realize if that's very low value, you might want to look into changing either your overlap ratio or the height of the flight to speed that up. Uh, elevation optimization would only be applicable to the Phantom 4 RTK and Matrice 210 version 2 RTK. Uh, drone will go to the center and take some additional photos to improve the elevation values there. So option to use if you are utilizing those drones. Upon completion, have the options to return to home, have the drone hover, and you can manually fly it back, or in some interesting scenario, if you need to land the drone, that's also an option there. Uh, moving into the advanced settings, here's where you can change the overlap ratios. We talked about the side overlap, front overlap, course angle. You can see right now we're going straight up and down. If you change that course angle, it would also change the S on the map, which is your start point there, currently in the bottom left. So if we move that course angle, the start point would move up to the top left and the drone would start going left and right. With this being a straight square here, not a huge deal of which way we're going, but if you have an interesting polygon drawn, uh, changing that course angle can save you some time. And then on the bottom here, we have margin, which is feet. You can see right now, it's actually going outside of the boundaries even though the margin is zero feet, which is a current uh, issue with our software. So working on resolving that right now, but essentially our margin there is how far outside of the boundaries you'd like the drone to fly during the mission flight. 
it is smart, if applicable, to add a little bit of margin or draw your flight area a bit larger than the exact area we're mapping. As you can see, because the very extent there, we're just taking a single line of photos. <laughs> oh, and one more there before we moved on was photo mode that I had touched on earlier. We can do timed interval shots, so the camera is taking a photo for example, every two seconds or distance where it's taking photos based on the distance. And I'd say the only time that really comes into play is if you're doing timed interval shots. I've seen a few more photos coming around the turns here as the drone does slow up from its speed during the mission flight to make those turns. So it can be capturing a few extra photos there. If we're looking to create a 3D model, you can still use the mapping data to do so. But another option we have within the app here is oblique mission planning. So circling back to where we started, uh, when you create a route and select oblique, you have the ability to fly multiple missions in one. So we got a five for one sale going here potentially. You have your first mission, which is your regular mapping flight, but then moving on here, you can see number two, it's actually coming at our scene from the side and going back and forth. The camera's gonna be pointing at the scene in the middle the whole time, but the camera is now angled up uh, at a gimbal pitch there. You can see on the, the right side pointing at the scene instead of pointing straight down. So in our experience, this provides some data of the sides of when we're mapping instead of just pointing straight down so it can lead to some better results with your 3d model generation but fairly self-explanatory here the one two three four five just going kind of around the horn here so if we skip ahead to five you can see it at you know, the top side here and the area of the flight does depend as we see a different scene here on where you you've planned that and when you actually go to play your mission you can say hey you know, maybe there's something we can't fly over on one of these sides. So you can say to only do one, three, four, and five, or one and three. So you can pick just a singular or multiple oblique flights out of uh, the entire one. The mission planning items on the right side are pretty much the same, except you can control the gimbal pitch when it is flying those oblique flights on each side of your mission area. Something to consider here, as you can see, is that it does increase the size of your flight area when you are doing an oblique mission flight. So we'll cover another option here later on if you're looking to create or collect some data from around the object. So that covers mission planning there. And next up, moving into the data collection uh, itself. So self-explanatory to a point, if we are running a mapping mission, you would just save it, click the play button, you'll have a pre-flight checklist pop up and you can start the mission. But I would say before doing that, we do have some camera settings uh, to consider as before we start that mission flight itself. So once again, circling back to my earlier point, the applicability here does vary by which platform you're flying. Some of these don't necessarily apply. For example, if we have you know, the Mavic Enterprise Dual or Advanced, we don't necessarily have as many manual camera options as those weren't necessarily built for a mapping application. They still can get the job done, you just don't have as much granular control over some of these values. One item to consider as well is you can put the drone up at the altitude you're flying and take a look at what the camera looks like beforehand. You can start the mission while the drone is in the air. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the ground uh, before you start the mission. So putting your drone up at altitude and maybe taking a look at some of these settings uh, is something you can do. Now, uh, if we're working with the Phantom 4 RTK, Phantom 4 Pro, uh, X7, P1, uh, 
good to turn the mechanical shutter on. With a mechanical shutter, for seeing you know propeller moving and we were taking a picture of it, you'd see a blurry propeller if we weren't using a mechanical or global shutter. If you're using a rolling shutter, that's what leads to that uh, distortion there. So turning a mechanical shutter on since the drone is moving as we are mapping uh, is a good option there and a nice feature of a camera for surveying and mapping. Furthermore, if you're having issues with image blur, would certainly try increasing the shutter speed to 500 or faster. Uh, if you're still experiencing issues at that point, could set your camera's focus to manual and then infinity, so essentially as far away as possible as we're mapping, so nothing's gonna be uh, close up. Uh, potentially, you know, with autofocus may uh, run into some issues there with varying terrain, but for the most part, should not be a major issue there. Um, on the exposure side, I can keep the ISO value the same and adjust your aperture if you're having issues, once again, on the exposure side. But depending on the scene, if you're using auto exposure there, you may see, especially with shadows, um, some changing exposure during the mapping. So manually setting that and adjusting your aperture can lead to some better results. And then finally, if it is applicable with your camera, sticking with the native aspect ratio, or I believe the exact setting in DJI Pilot is called image size, making sure that's four by three or three by two uh, gives us the largest image coverage. If you were to select 16 by nine instead, that's actually a video size and is cropping your image and does not lead to uh, great results there. I even know some photogrammetry software don't work unless you have the correct aspect ratio uh, for the drone, which would be its native aspect ratio and giving us the greatest amount of coverage. So once again, some settings to consider here. Once again, if we're trying to get a quick map, quickly planning, putting it up with the auto settings uh, often leads to results that are perfectly fine. But if we're looking to get, get a bit more granular here during some of your trainings or planning missions here, playing around with some of these settings, taking note and looking to see if you're able to improve your results based on the environment is a good item. So I talked about earlier the oblique flight capability to capture oblique data coming from the side of the object. Another avenue is to do that manually. So when we're doing this, some things to consider if we're not just running an automated mission is that we want to keep the sky out of the photo. For one, your field of view just gets very long. And then think about our photogrammetry software here trying to stitch the sky together. Not really what it is meant to or able to do. Um, on the drone itself, you can make life easier instead of having to continuously press the camera button by adding uh, time interval shots. You can put that at every three seconds, take a photo, or every five seconds and then slowly move you know, the drone. You could see a circular pattern was used here. Get that overlap of the photos there, and that is another avenue to collect data. So we find some agencies actually find it faster to do this for their scene, or they prefer to do it this way rather than the automated mission capture, or they add it as a supplement here. Something you just consider here is ideally you don't want photos at a variety of altitudes as we do have different GSD there. But if you're looking at you know doing adding you know a circle of manual data capture and an overhead a data capture, have seen some some good results there. One other note is if we're on scene collecting evidence, beware of prop wash especially during flight if you're landing near the scene, standing up a landing zone, 
in a different area can lead to better results. So at this point, we've planned our mission, have captured the data, and next up, we can move into the actual processing. And on the DJI side, we have our software called DJI Terra. You can use DJI Terra for mission planning, uh, specifically with the Phantom 4 series, you can do some mission planning in DJI Terra and actually run it from inside the Terra software. But looking to apply to as many drones as we could today, I didn't necessarily get into that, but certainly something you can investigate if you're using the Phantom 4 series there. But after completing that mission planning and data acquisition, we can bring that data from any drone, from any mission planning software that has been collecting the data and generate our maps and complete analyzation. So we'll run through how that works today. Something to note with Terra is it does require a high-powered Windows machine. With any photogrammetry software, if you're looking to process your data offline, you're going to need a computer with some serious horsepower. So you can see minimum specs here and recommended specs. You know, GPU, obviously a good boost there to our computer specs. If you're familiar with a gaming laptop or gaming, I'm sure this makes more sense to you as well. But as you move up from the minimum specs to the recommended specs, you're going to see quicker processing times there as well. Some of the advantages of DJI Terra is it's built with our drones in mind. So with that, it's able to process images up to six times faster than other mapping softwares. And then as you'll see, it's a very intuitive, straightforward workflow within the software. You have the key tools there uh, to generate the deliverables you need, and it leads itself to being a very concise workflow. So in regards to data processing here, after opening the software on your Windows computer. You can go ahead and click New Mission in the bottom left. You'll be able to select a 2D map or a 3D model in our case. You can also do some different things like multi-spectral maps and LiDAR point cloud processing, even though not necessarily applicable to us today. After that, in the top right, you'll see the option to upload individual images or a photo as a whole. So you can click on that and bring your imagery in. It's nice right away, you're able to see the location of all those images. Then you can click on the photo icon in the top right to toggle that on and off. For mapping scene, usually best to just stick with normal there based off of our data collection. Resolution, if you have the option here to lower your processing time, so for medium, for example, if you just want 50% resolution and you want it to be processed quicker, that's an option you have there. And you'll see that throughout DJI Terra here, we have different options where you can really speed up your offline processing of this data. Uh, in regards to some of the outputs here, you can get here, you can select, select specific point clouds, models. If you're trying to pull this from DJI Terra into another software, if you want to combine 3D point clouds, we've seen that done before where folks are doing laser scanners on the ground, and then the drone can help provide some aerial data when you take the 3D model that point cloud from the drone and combine it with the ground-based units. So really, there's really not too many settings on the Terra side before getting going. Some other, I guess, more in-depth settings you say, I've talked about ground control points and checkpoints before. You can import those into Terra here, mark them before processing. So you can put that into an easy spreadsheet, check that info with your map, and optimize our map for increased accuracy. You can change your output coordinate settings. And then another tool to increase the speed would be region of interest reconstruction. So you can see 
on our initial settings there, we can draw a specific area we want for the map. Uh, after the fact, and Terra is only going to be processing the map for that area instead of processing and spending time on stuff outside of it. So even if you spent a little more time uh, during the actual mapping phase to make sure you have everything covered, when you go to process it, you can select the specific region of interest. So after we've gone ahead and processed that, as you can see, just a few clicks within the Terra software, we have our photogrammetry output. On the 3D model side, we're able to visualize the scene, can zoom in, zoom out, manipulate your way around. We can take measurements such as distance, uh, the volume that Eric showed with in the landslide type scenario, and we can also get a select point based on a GPS location. And you can do this with your 2D map or 3D model. We're seeing 2D maps uh, output used a lot for the planning side. So this was a COVID site previously in that the municipality needed some ability to pre-plan. And once again, different buildings within the community having an up-to-date, high-resolution map of that area can be very useful on the pre-planning side. Here's an example with the campfire in California with some of the GIS integration overlaying roads and also previous satellite imagery to see the unfortunate reality of where things are now. Very useful for the community damage assessment and insurance claims. And another one here, we had the Florida State University team uh, and Texas A&M Krasar team out, and they were doing some mapping at the unfortunate Surfside condo collapse. So used DJI drones among others here, and they were able to help update first responders. There was situational awareness where they were flying the scene every few hours and first responders before going on scene had the ability to reference these maps and models and get information. You can see on the right side there, the ability to look at elevation, volumetrics, and provide an ongoing updated live map in this sense here. On the fire service side, uh, with wildfires, we're seeing folks take this output and try to assess uh, the impact, or in a lot of these scenarios, such as the campfire scenario, the smoke was really too thick to use manned aircraft. So combining the use of drones on a ground-based, and we also see the use of panoramas, actually, though it isn't a 2D map or a 3D model per se, uh, seeing the use of panoramas as an easily shareable, deliverable in these type of scenarios as well. Uh, screenshot here on the right is from a partner's LAFD's YouTube, where they talk about using drones for brush clearance inspection program. So helping strategize for brush clearance and create defensible space, a useful tool as well. And then on the post-fire investigation side, capture and creating a measurable scene for investigation and helping teams avoid any unnecessary risks. And talking with folks, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, the ease of being able to put the drone up and take a photo instead of having to actually call a ladder truck out to the scene. Uh, but sometimes being able to create a 2D model, a 2D map or 3D model of the scene adds another level based on the scenario uh, that is needed. So we'll toss it back over to Eric here to go over some resources, but hopefully that gave you all an idea of how with your DJI drones, you could create 2D map or 3D model. And back over to you, Eric. Thanks, Grant. So to start off with the first uh, resource, uh, we're giving out, so we're developing this guidebook on using drones for mapping for emergency response. It's de we're designing this guidebook for beginners who don't know how where to start, and it will give you step-by-step -step information. It will give you um, information on what system requirements you need to set up DJI Terra. 
So uh, right now, the guidebook isn't available yet, but around mid-October, we target to have this done. And if you sign up on this link that I sent over via chat, you will receive the guidebook as soon as it's ready. On to the next slide. Next slide. On to the next slide. So we've noticed that a lot of public safety uh, personnel would prefer to not have geofencing restrictions when it comes to flying drones. So if your department needs um, special access or special unlock, we developed this program just for you. Um, at the moment, it's only available for public safety entities that are in North America and Europe. So feel free to check that link out so you could yeah, avail of that program. Lastly, exclusive to the attendees of this webinar, we're giving out the free one month um, Terra License Pro. So if you want to try it out, see how DJI Terra works and how it could impact your operations, we're giving away a free one month license. And all you need to do is sign up on that form so we will send you a trial code. So over to Grant again for the Q&A portion. And if you have further questions, just send it right away and we'll get right to it. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we you toggle me on to organizer side just for those questions, if you're able to do that on your end. And two notes there on the resources Eric shared. First one being the QEP program. If you're outside of that North America or Europe region with our new FlySafe portal, you can also register as a governmental entity, provide image of governmental identification, and with that, you can get long-term unlocking licenses for your country, so hopefully making life easier there as well. That would be fly-safe.dgi.com or if you just Googled FlySafe and want to do a custom unlock from the link on our FlySafe page, that'll take you to that portal as well. And just one of the options you'll see when registering. And then on the Terra side, if you weren't sure about if the specs are working or utilizing different photogrammetry software, hopefully that's an easy avenue for you to give DJI Terra a try and see the type of deliverables you're able to get um, Eric, on my side, still not seeing uh, the question side. I don't know if you're able to make me an organizer or if you had some of the key questions there you wanted to share. Happy to answer them on my end. Uh, Grant, I send them uh, in the chat function. Uh, he, the questions are, should be there. Uh, but I could read it out loud. So question number one is from Joel. He's asking if when flying a manual flight with the M300 RPK, can he figure out acres on a fire if he flies with the fire perimeter? Sorry, Eric, I broke up there for a second, but uh, just touch that last base. You said flying manually M300 on a fire. And what was the specific scenario we're looking to do here? If he flies with the fire perimeter, flies the fire perimeter. Um, I'd say it'd be difficult to generate a map or model if it's a fairly large area uh, without going without going. Some ability to take photos there but really you'd have a big hole in the middle where you don't have sufficient data or overlap uh, to to collect that so if it was a small enough area like we showed the ability to fly the circle around it you have some potential there but in a large fire area wouldn't see uh, ability to do that here right okay question So question number two is from Matthew. When mapping in moderate to heavy wind, do you recommend adjusting the force angle to fly with the wind as opposed to with the crosswind? 
So I fly with the wind as opposed to with a crosswind. Yeah. Hmm. Good question there. Um, I'd say with that going, once again, when you're, I guess, flying the mapping mission, you don't have any choice but to go uh, back and forth, obviously. So I'd recommend going with the crosswind rather than into the wind because uh, you're just going to be really potentially struggling one way if you're flying into the wind and the drone may not even be able to meet the, the speed that you have programmed where if you're going into the, the crosswind you have more of a you know even mapping avenue both going both ways the drone's kind of taking the same amount of wind uh, so it wouldn't lead to as many issues there so i would say flying with the uh, crosswind hitting both sides of the drone instead of going into and then getting pushed by the wind So next question is from Dominic. Does the toxicity of chemicals affect the camera and the drone's electronic senses? Does toxicity of chemicals affect the camera and the drone's electronic senses? I don't have a ton of information on this one transparently. Uh, our friends at Southern Manatee Fire Rescue have done some testing regarding the use of drones in different hazmat uh, types scenarios. Um, so referencing their videos on their YouTube, Southern Manatee Fire Rescue find to be very useful and they have different uh, information on, you know, deconning drones and those uh, more in-depth details there. So. Uh, Jason uh, English is asking, so on altitude, they have a few mission flights that despite programming the X7 35 millimeter camera and the flight altitude, GSC slow speed, the images have been unclear. They fly in priority flat, no elevation area. Da, da, da. Yeah, um, potentially trying manual focus there would be a good option or shutter, shutter priority there. Um, I think my email is on one of the initial slides, Jason, but we have a X7 uh, workflow there with some specific settings you, you might try. So uh, we'll send uh, my email as a answer there in the, the chat as well and can follow up uh, post webinar here with that detailed information with the X7 specifically that could help you all out. Um, uh, here's an interesting question from Martin. He's asking if uh, you could map, could, could one map with a thermal camera with the Mavic 2 Enterprise Advance? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, and there's multiple things to consider here. First off, your thermal sensor is only 640 by 512, which we're like, wow, that's a great thermal camera, especially, you know, compared to, you know, the previous dual. But we're looking at you know, thousands when we're talking about a visual camera. So with a 640 by 512, you just have a very small field of view. So it takes a lot of photos. Uh, furthermore, to do this, it requires a lot of overlap. So in generating a thermal map, which we'd want to make temperature measurements of, it's very difficult. And it's not something that's offered in DJI Terra, and only offered with some older thermal cameras to my knowledge in other photogrammetry software uh, just because i think the workflow has been so difficult that folks ne haven't necessarily moved moved forward with it as a robust workflow that being said if you're just trying to visualize an area you can technically do that with thermal photos of an area but that map, even in you know, DJI Terra, it's just basing it uh, like visual photos off of the scene. It's just going to be a picture, not something we can measure. So long answer short, yes, you could do it if you're just looking for a visual picture. No, there's not necessarily an easy workflow to do that with the advanced or the H20T thermal camera where you're able to measure points accurately. 
Um, and kind of getting into that a little more further too, if we're flying back and forth, we're trying to stitch those uh, values together, just getting accurate radiometric data there is quite complicated. So that's why you see a lot of folks just do that more on the inspection side with uh, specific items. But situational awareness uh, with a thermal map could be useful. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Seeing the questions now, on Eric, on my end, so I can run a few more through. Thanks for that. Um, is there an option for the drone to momentarily stop at each point to ensure camera stability? And I've heard some folks like to do this for night mapping as well. Unfortunately, that's not an option with DJI Pilot right now. It is in Ground Station Pro, and it's under consideration for addition in uh, DJI Pilot moving forward. Mm, asked about other drones such as the Mavic Air 2. Um, so on the DJI side, though the Mavic Air 2 is a great bird, doesn't necessarily fall into our enterprise drone side of, of the things. Um, if you manually flew an area, you could post-process it with the Mavic Air 2 photos, um, but that's all pending on I guess really SDK release on something like the Mavic Air 2 for further automated mapping capabilities. If you would like to process those manually, that's um, an option. I would say our focus though is on the, the enterprise side of the house drones for the mapping and surveying features. Here's another question from Michael. Um, tell us, could you tell us more about the different levels of DJI Terra? P1, L1, Multispectra all comes with a six-month license, but he had noticed that they come in different versions. Uh, yeah, if you could tell us more on that, Brent. Yeah, <laughs> instead of me trying to uh, verbalize a, a spreadsheet there, it's probably easiest um, to check our website. We have a table on our DJI Terra page showing the, the different features there. Um, and then, Michael, if you have any further questions on the different tiers there, please do follow up and happy to go in, in more depth there. But uh, the website kind of shows this this tier comes with, you know, this these these features. So hopefully that is, is helpful. You can also download a free version of DJI Terra. So within your team, uh, if folks wanted to, you know, view models and maps that you had generated, that's potentially useful tool as well, where they're not, you know, paying for the processing capability, but they do have the viewing capability for something like those 3D models. All right. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time anymore, but thank you, Grant, for sharing those wonderful insights with regard to DJI Terra and using our drones for mapping. Uh, we'll try to send over or answer some of your questions and send over the additional uh, references or resources that we've took you through. Uh, yeah, that ends our webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Bye.